So the title of my talk is An Evolutionary Argument Against Naturalism. Evolutionary argument against naturalism? In what kind of warped and twisted mind could such a thing even be conceived? Why, in the mind of Alvin Plantinga, of course. For the next several minutes, sit quietly and I will control all that you see and hear. You are about to participate in a great philosophical adventure. You are about to experience the awe and mystery that reaches from the outer mind to the inner limits. And then when I use the word naturalism, what I mean is um, really the belief that there's no such person as God or anything like God. So naturalism is uh, stronger than atheism. Naturalism entails atheism, but um, atheism doesn't entail naturalism. You can be an atheist without rising to the heights of or sinking to the depths of whatever you think is appropriate. If naturalism. Plantinga were honest, he would have told us that naturalism comes in two forms, metaphysical naturalism and methodological naturalism. Metaphysical naturalism our philosophical naturalism, our ontological naturalism, whatever you want to call it, is much closer to the kinds of philosophical stances philosophers are used to. It takes methodological naturalism, something that is at the core of the scientific method, and turns it into something akin to a metaphysical dogma. Neither form of naturalism explicitly denies the existence of God as Plantinga claims. Rather, they withhold judgment on a class of things of which God is only a member, and they do it for several very good reasons. I like the way David Brooks summed up methodological naturalism. To explain the unknown by the known is a logical procedure. To explain the known by the unknown is a form of theological lunacy. God, the supernatural, UFOs, and a shitload of other things fall into the category of being unknowns, unexplainable, unmeasurable, and vague. So the real stance is not so much that there is no God, but rather it is put up or shut up before you make a claim about God, I will accept as representing any kind of truth claim about reality. Um, evolution is often thought of as kind of a pillar in the temple of naturalism, if naturalism does in fact have a, a uh, a temple. But I want to argue that they don't fit together. I want to argue that one can't sensibly be both a naturalist and accept evolution as evolution is ordinarily thought of. I want to say they conflict with each other. They go against each other. The conjunction of the two, naturalism and evolution, I want to argue, um, shoots itself in the foot. Or if you want a more complicated, learned sounding way to put it, um, is self-referentially incoherent. All right? That's what I want to argue. And I propose to argue... In my opinion, it is Platinga who has shot himself in the foot. One thing to keep in mind about Plantinga's argument is that it was first made in 1993, and in the decade plus eight years since made, it has not convinced any naturalist I know of. You have to wonder if it is supposed to be such a good argument why it hasn't. So these would be cognitive faculties. And, um, and in brief, here's how my argument will go. I'll argue that if naturalism and evolution, if that pair of propositions, if that conjunction, if they were both true, then it would be improbable that our cognitive faculties, memory and so on and so on, improbable that they are in fact reliable, that they give us, for the most part, true beliefs. All right. It's an empirical fact that all those cognitive faculties, memory, perception, induction, learning from experience, are unreliable. There will be links in the underbar showing you just how unreliable each of those faculties is.
if Plantinga's philosophical stance depends on human beings having accurate cognitive faculties, then he is a scientific illiterate living in a delusion. But that's not what he really believes. The real question, as Plantinga knows, but can never clearly state, is which of our cognitive faculties can be counted on by evolution to have better reliability and which cognitive faculties are most likely unreliable. I will argue that it is exactly the cognitive faculties we can expect evolution to sharpen that science and philosophical naturalism exploit, while religion, metaphysics, and philosophy exploit our most flawed cognitive faculties those faculties which are least needed for survival and reproduction and can thus be expected to be the most in error and then I will demonstrate that this is exactly what our psychology experiments and our history shows to be the case. Well, once you see that, then if you accept naturalism and evolution, you have a defeater for this proposition that your cognitive faculties are reliable, a reason to give that proposition up a reason not to believe it. And once you have a defeater for that proposition, that your cognitive faculties are reliable, then you have a defeater for any proposition that you take to be produced by your cognitive faculties. The dishonest move that Platenga makes here is called lumping. He wrongly assumes that all cognitive faculties are equal. They are not. Some of our cognitive faculties were honed to a sharper degree than others by evolution. Looking at our ancient pre-human ancestors and their stone tools, we can see that what they believed about the rocks they chipped and shaped into deadly tools was a matter of survival. If they failed to grasp what was involved in the craft of making and using stone tools they had a higher probability of dying. Thus, their belief-forming mechanisms mattered. At some level, they had to truly know their rocks and their environment because what they knew about them was tested every day they had to eat meat and could not forage for plant food. What they believed about gods and life after death was not tested in the same way as their technological knowledge. The scientific method was born in the brains of our pre-human ancestors once they started experimenting with stone tools. However, once we did that and thus became the designers and shapers of material objects, we also introduced the possibility that our world and ourselves were also the product of some greater designer and shaper. But that idea could never be tested in the same way we test the effectiveness of a stone axe. Nor was the truth of the God hypothesis important for our survival. It is this testability that sets science apart from our religion and makes us more certain of science. Plantinga's formulation has another related problem. It's not just evolutionary theory that points to the possibility of errors in our cognitive mechanisms. It's other people with beliefs we do not agree with. What is Platinga going to make of the beliefs of the Aztecs who cut out the hearts of sacrificial victims and offered them to their sun god? Is that a correct belief system in his opinion? What does he make of the beliefs of Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and others? Obviously, all people do not have access to 100% reliable knowledge in the realms of religion and philosophy if we have all these different belief systems. And yet, the core science in all modern cultures is the same. Across the educated world, we almost all agree with basic scientific findings. The existence of atoms, a heliocentric solar system, the ability of math to model on computers, things like weather systems and jet engines. We all agree on the speed of light, the circumference of the Earth, and so much more. Science recognizes its limits and the inner limits of our human cognitive facilities 
and it works within those limits by testing and retesting its claims to knowledge. Religion does not recognize that inner limit, nor does it test its claims, and it sounds like Platinga cannot even comprehend what that inner limit is or how knowledge needs to be tested. I haven't heard his whole argument yet, though. I've only listened to part one of six. It will be interesting to see how he deals with those obvious objections. Feel free to skip ahead and see how Plantinga addresses the problems and let me know in the comments. I'll see you next time on The Inner Limits. <laughs>